This is gonna take Cracker Jack timing, Wang. Total concentration. You ready, Jack? I was born ready. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. It's time for another comic book retrospective. We've been alternating between Marvel and DC. This week we're on DC. We're going to do some Superman Essentials. We're going to do Action Comics 544 through 546, the, the evolution of the new Brainiac, essentially is what this story is. Very fantastic. Written by Marv Wolfman, illustrated by Gil Kane. Some of the, I don't know, is, is this the best Superman artist of all times, Joe? Uh, that that's tough. I mean, it's a good thing Kurt Swan can't hear us, but uh, <laughs> but no, I, I mean, Gil Kane is one of the best artists of all time. It's yeah. it's 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 tough to to compare. I I love his his style from the eighties. I, I love his like you know CRISPR work in like the seventies on Spider Man. Um, you know, he's one of the architects of the DC Silver Age with John Broom on, uh, you know, Green Lantern. And then, you know, we've talked before about, you know, Bob Kaniger and uh, Carmine Infantino on The Flash and how, you know, those teams with people like Mort Whitesinger on Superman, uh, you know, sort of leading that group and expanding the Superman family being like that foundation of like that uh mid to late fifties silver age that, that DC was cultivating. But, but yeah, I, I mean, he, he's certainly one of the best uh, people to ever draw Superman. You, I love the way he lays out a page. You look at it, like, it feels ahead of its time in, in some ways here. Like you, you see a lot of these layouts are kind of, I feel like similar to, how, you know, during like the image revolution, you know, um, just like 10 years later, you see more of these kind of layouts. You know, I feel like, I guess like Walt Simonson kind of does uh, some similar dynamic uh, work. But, but yeah, it's, he's, he's really good. Yeah. So this, this story is fantastic. Obviously also with us is Eric Breen, the comic book quarter. Eric, so you would have been reading comic books at this time. When you picked up Action Comics 544, obviously it's a two-parter. The first story is Lex Luthor, basically the new version of Lex Luthor, and the second story is the new version of Brainiac, which is the one we're going to key in on. Like, What are the thoughts? Is your mind blown here? Does this feel like a, a natural progression of the villain? Well, first I'll just say that when this came out, a lot of anniversary issues were hitting within about the same year, and DC was doing special issues for all of them. And they all had similar trade dress, and they were they they felt like events. So yeah, and this one, um, what what my takeaway was more from from this particular one was just how much better Superman was in Action Comics with Marv Wolfman writing him than what was going on in Superman at the time, which were basically just one and two part stories written for you know my much younger brother if i had had one yeah. this the the wolfman story in particular i said it was it was part of you know while while he was on the book he did all the things that you want in a good comic book you had subplots you had consequences you had it was it really felt like you were reading a marvel comic which at the time, you weren't getting out of Superman and weren't going to get again until Byrne took over. Yeah. So, Joe, this comic book comes out, is it 1983? It's 83. Um, it came out, you know, June of 1983, which means about March. Um, okay. And, uh, again, to put this in perspective, this is the part that's both exciting and deeply depressing, I, I think, for people uh, to understand just what the other options were are um, what else you could have gotten uh, the month this came out was uh, in terms of the top three selling uh, team books, you know, Uncanny X-Men, Teen Titans and Legion, Uncanny X-Men 170 came out, uh, you know, Claremont and Paul Smith from his pretty short stint on the book. This was the issue where, uh, Storm beat Calypso and took control of the Morlocks. So uh, a fairly key kind of issue from that time. 
then you can cut over to Legion, uh, just like Brian was saying, this was the uh, 300th issue of the Legion of Superheroes. So it had that similar trade dress to this Action 544. Uh, you know, it's Paul Levitz and um, Keith Giffen. Yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it was a nice uh, little issue. This is leading into, this is still kind of dealing with the aftermath of the Great Darkness Saga. And with Teen Titans, Marv Wolfman again with George Perez on, I think it was three, I think it was issue 32. It was, um, this is like Terra has now joined the team. All the pieces are being laid for, you know, the Judas contract coming up. So you, you have a lot of excitement there. Uh, if you're big on Iron Man, uh, this is during Denny O'Neill's run. Uh, James Rhodes is Iron Man at the moment. Uh, while this is happening. If you're a Cap fan, you're in the middle of the J.M. DeMattis, Mike Zek run with uh, Mark Grunwald editing, who would later uh, take over the title. So when you're you're looking at all this stuff, oh, and uh, you know, Doug Mank had taken over Batman from uh, Jerry Conway. Uh, so you're getting artists like Gene Cullen and Don Newton uh, doing, you know, the art in alternating, you know, Batman and Detective so this is such an incredible time. I feel like it's just one of those things where it's like, I can't fathom that many big two comics of that quality coming out in the same month anymore. Well, Joe, I was 21 at the time and that stuff was going so well. It was cutting into my drinking. Oh, you were if you're drinking money or you're drinking time, both. Both. Yeah. No, I so that, that eighty-three was yeah. You know, hell, if, I think uh, Simonson's Thor had started by then. Also, it was just about to start. Yeah, he. Yeah. Um, it was like a few months. Simonson's Thor was starting, and then only a couple of months after Thor's uh, Simonson's Thor is Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. Oh, yeah, kind like some of the. The, the like the greatest comic <laughs> runs of all time all kind of starting up and obviously we're entering yeah. at a time at Marvel where they end up hitting on all, all cylinders and you're getting some of the, the like the the runs that you when people ask you what should you go read you know Claremont's on Getty X Men you know uh, Simonson's Thor Frank Miller's Daredevil you know some of these oh. like iconic runs. Oh, and, and I forgot there was this uh, little duo of Roger Stern and J.R.J.R. JR. on Spider-Man uh, at the time. Well, this that is all happening. We have you know. that. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, uh, it's, um, all of that's happening at all at the, the same time. And then uh, during this, you know, the next month, so, so when Action uh, 545 was happening, it was when Rogue joins the X-Men. So, you know, again, another important kind of issue. You, you know, it's... And the, the best run of Moon Knight was in full swing at the time. Mm -hmm. So there, there was, yeah, there was a heck of a lot of good stuff on the shelves in 83. Yeah. And Superman's uh, kind of in a weird place. We know that mm -hmm. he is going to be rebooted in a few years, and there's disparity in between the two titles. Marv Wolfman is, is a fantastic Superman writer. I don't think mm -hmm. that he, he gets the credit that he's due. And we're going to definitely see that in here in this comic. But if you're yeah. looking for something Marv Wolfman Superman related and you haven't read that Man and Superman 100 page spectacular that got released about within the last 24 months, it's relatively like recent. Like that is a spectacular kind of origin of, of Clark Kent in Metropolis. Yeah. So are we ready to get into this story, Bell? Tell us. I, I think so. All right, so the A story is from Carrie Bates and Kurt Swan. It's Luther Unleashed. And then the B story, what a wealth of riches to, to be reading action comics at this time, is <laughs> yeah. Rebirth, a name that we hear, hear synonymous with uh, DC characters over the years. We even had an entire reboot called Rebirth. And this is from Marv Wolfman and Gil Kane. It, it's interesting. This is a different take on Superman. He's starting to feel a bit, little bit alienated in Metropolis, uh, Breen, and he's going to need to leave and go off to, like, a, a, I don't know, computerized planet where Brainiac is essentially, I believe, in, like, stasis. Is that what's going on, Brain? Well, yeah, th again, this was, you know, Marv Wolfman was writing Superman for a little bit of an older audience, mm -hmm. and there's a a scene where, where he comes in and, and saves a, a child, 
and as he's you know, a little blind girl and she's saying, you know, I heard you're the greatest, you know, hero of all. And he goes, you know, I'm just a man. You know, I'm glad you're safe. Take care. And he takes off. And then you, you go to a crowd shot and the people are going, yeah, that Superman sure is something. Then the one guy goes, you know, yeah, but what if he ever turns that power on us? And that's something that, I mean, it, it would, it would be touched on in, you know, imaginary tales and stuff like that but this it just felt like it had a, a greater weight because it was it was like wolfman was on the title for long enough to where something like that wasn't just a throwaway line necessarily it was kind of a now it, I, I i kind of expected superman to have picked that up with his super hearing they didn't go there mm-hmm. but it's it's like you know he's you know superman is kind of written as if the the what he does the spectacular feats he performs in lesser writers hands. It was just matter of fact. And this was, it's sort of taking its toll on him a little bit that you kind of feel like it's, you know, he, he feels it. It's like a mental strain on him. Whereas other writers would never really go there. And also touching on his, you know, the, the difference between the Superman and the Clark Kent, which, yeah, you know, there's a part later in the story where it says he's enjoying being Clark Kent more. But I don't want to get yeah. ahead of myself. But this is something that, that you know, w- kind of made this this story you know, a little bit more interesting. Yeah, yeah. You would imagine being Superman that that would be wearing on you. you know? And then you know he he's aware he's an alien. He's he's not maybe he he is. You know he's from Smallville. He's he's been Smallville. He's been raised human, but he knows there's a little bit of a difference. He's an outlier. And he feels like he needs to go away, Joe. And he ends up going to this. It's a is it a prison planet? Is that where where uh, the last time that Brainiac and he have fought? And he's kind of like yeah. just sitting. He's just like in the rest. Well, it turned into a prison for Brainiac because mm. um, he defeated him and he can't escape. And that was kind of where they had left uh, Brainiac. And you know, flies through it to sort of set up what what we see there. And um, and, and yeah, just to kind of build on, on what Green was saying uh, before, again, Marv Wolfman being a, a Marvel writer, some of what you see here is that that little bit of a relationship kind of dynamic between you know him and, and Lois and Lana, which is in this particular story is a little more in the background, but in some of Marv's other stories, it's uh, a bit more prominent. It's not quite as dramatic as what you might see in some Spider-Man comics, but, you know, it aged it up a little bit. It was like, oh, you know, not everything's perfect. You know, Lois is is uh, jealous of, of Lana and, you, you know, S- you know, Superman and Clark, you, you know, it's kind of, you know, still feeling out where he wants to go uh, with all of that. And, you know, normally you do these, you know, Lois is jealous kind of stories, but they were, you know, they were more kid-like. They were, you know, more over the top. But but here it, it just feels more subtle and more uh, like it's, you know, it's just something boiling inside her. And and it, it does elevate the story. But, but yeah, we see Superman, you know, flying through there. And, um, you know, he makes a comment about how uh, he's not going to have time to take a relaxing bath. He's going to have to shower which was interesting and it is one of those things where like if you're not thinking you might be like oh well can't he just you know he's super fast can't he just do that and it's like no the point being that you know a a bath is about you know just relaxing and and that's what he doesn't have time for it but he has time to get himself clean so Mm -hmm. and so brainiac is in in, he's in stasis he's on this prison planet that i believe the sun is called epsilon four and all of a sudden, when when Superman arrives, to ch- I guess he's checking in on Brainiac. the The sun goes supernova, and it turns out it's kind of because of Brainiac's presence there. Like, uh, but Brainiac stops being like a physical entity, is the way I understand it, and he mm-hmm. gets like blasted out as like a stream of conscience or a stream of data, and he's like absorbing all this uh, massive amounts of of it, new information as he's going around the galaxy. And we're seeing the transformation of uh, of Brainiac as he's gathering all this information. And when he finally returns to the prison planet, does he create a new body, or is it just it just happens? It gestates because um, you see, there's like um, you know, like a it, it it looks like you know an egg with a fetus in it. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, he like grows it because the the idea is uh, Brainiac's not quite alive, but he's also not quite a machine here, and and, and you see that through the story of, of Brainiac kind of still feeling out exactly you know what he is. What did you think about this evolution for the character? Character, obviously, the new when we see the new Brainiac, it's it feels like something that should have been a RoboCop or something. It's kind of it's not really for kids. Well, before I get there, I say real quick when we're t- when Joe was talking about uh, Lois being jealous of Lana, what made that so interesting was L- Lois was jealous of Lana professionally, mm-hmm. having no idea that Superman's secret identity was dating Lana. So I mean, on, on you know, if 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 she had a little bit more information, that would have worked on so many different levels. But as far as yes. Brainiac goes, uh, Brainiac in older stories had kind of been for lack of a better term, a green Lex Luthor. I mean, they would have the same goals and they would team up on multiple occasions. This story set him apart. I mean, this made him, this was something we'd never seen before, but again, because Superman was being written for an older audience. So, that Brainiac just wasn't going to work anymore. It's it, it just, like I said, a different colored Lex Luthor. Yeah. So this, this was like, it, it's, when you saw that well, the first time when you saw the, the machine that, you know, with the, the Brainiac looking head in the tentacles, it's like, yeah, this is, this is, this is new. And said, so this is, you know, it's, it's in this one's, this Brainiac's going to be a hell of a lot more dangerous. It is point out that, you know, the old Brainiac was a schemer. This one is a conqueror. Mm. He's definitely evolved, and I think that's a lot to do with the story that we get into. So he he gets this new ship, and it's like this enormous skull. It's one of the coolest designs, you know, within the whole book, Joe. Like Gil Kane, like knocks it out of the park with that ship. That thing is is crazy looking. Yeah. No, it's <laughs> it's yeah. The whole thing, just going through space, the stars, the planets. Um, just uh, you, you know the non-corporeal kind of brainiac, just like bits, just like flying through space. All of it, it's it, it's so so great, and and just and again, it's like these are you know now I know that um, you know now you can't have thought balloons in in comics because thought balloons are for idiots, and who would ever want to read a comic with thought balloons in it? But um, it turns out it's very easy to read, and it actually elevates the story when you can understand things that people are thinking that you're not necessarily showing. It's it's weird how that works. But but yeah, again, with Marv being you know a, a good writer, uh, there there are captions. I, I don't think it's a gratuitous amount. I, I think he does a, a pretty good job at um, keeping. Uh, you know, all this in the story to, to elevate it. And, and you really get this, you know, idea, you get this Brainiac who you're sort of following his journey. Brainiac at points is kind of like unsure and, uh, you know, comes off as maybe even like a, a little scared of, of what's going to happen as, as things go. And then, you know, becomes this, you know, really uh, deadly I- intimidating machine as, as time passes, because we also show in here how, you know, Brainiac's like developing and it takes months and, and we get this nice little like montage of, uh, y- you know, Lois and, and Superman kind of being more romantic, less romantic, um, going back to uh, just one panel of the like eight part story that was a little before this where... Um, you know, Satana splits uh, Superman into two and keeps one of his duplicates in in the past to weaken him. Um, you, you know, you're, you're just seeing all that as, as Brainiac is just learning more and, and plotting away and, and figuring out his next move. And his next move, as you would imagine, you got a diabolical robot that's, uh, you know, he's kind of living, he's kind of not. He's going to go start conquering worlds. He goes, to, I believe it's called Sisters 2, and essentially enslaves the, the planet brain. 
Yeah, and the once you know he does that, and as the story progresses a little farther, the 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 leader of Sistus Two makes his way to Superman and says, "You know, we've been, we've been conquered," and he goes, "We need your help to fight this Brainiac." And Superman's like, "Wait a second, that's Brainiac's dead, dead. and that was never really his thing either." But I, I think it was like Korga or something. He goes, but I trust, I trust him. Scora. Yes, I trust him as a great leader. So I'm going to go check it out, and that's when he goes to Sistus Two. Go well. No, and gets attacked by the now enslaved people that are uh, beings that have survived Brainiac's onslaught, and they eventually, what you know, they're able to take him down. Through I believe Red Sun, some kind of Red Sun device, which Runs robs Red his, Sun torpedo, yeah. yeah, which robs him of his powers. Which you know, eventually when they you know he, they beat him, they cart him off before you know they're conquered, and that's when he gets his first look at the new Brainiac. It'd be mm. terrifying, you're Superman at this point. So things aren't going well for Superman. Brainiac has evolved to all these things. Then the second issue, issue 545, is where we really start learning about Brainiac because he essentially, he has Superman like in, in, in captivity and he wants to learn about the master programmer. So he starts, I don't know, Breen, would you, or I'm sorry, we'll throw this one to Joe. Joe, is he, you, would you say that he's torturing him or just analyzing him? Both? At this point, he's analyzing him without uh, concern for his comfort. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know but um but yeah you'll also notice this issue um is lettered by uh todd klein um who would go on to be uh one of the most recognized names in, in lettering particularly at, at dc comics um the eisner awards tend to be a pass off between who's going to win it this year is it going to be todd klein or john workman and, uh, you know, I feel like they kind of, you know, pass it back and forth uh, with each other. Uh, Todd Klein is, is one of the only letterers that I do have his signature because he's Todd Klein. But, but yeah, uh, all, all, all that aside, it's, it's intimidating here. You, you see this really diabolical, cold brainiac. Like, without that human face, he does it. Like, the way Gil Kane illustrates Brainiac with the, you know, you, you have those like small red eyes. You, you have this very dull, cold sort of face, like a robot, but you know, some of these sequences you look in just the way there's this like black strip around where like a mouth would be like just grins ever so slightly as as he's like just being really uh devious like there's one panel like uh page five you know where uh it's a close-up on brainiac and you see it's like it just it does make it look like he's just grinning a little sinisterly as he's saying you know you lie you would destroy me which is why i must destroy you so, yeah so he's talking the whole time brain and it's it's creepy as hell because he's doing all these things and then he's letting superman know what he's doing and why he's doing it along the way this really creepy stuff. Yeah, and he keeps talking about a master programmer that yes. Superman serves. And Superman's like, yeah, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> but he can't do anything about it because I said he's you know, he doesn't have his powers, so finally but there's, there's, there's one part of dialogue I have to talk about, Brady, sure. before we, we start moving on. At one point they're talking and this is what Brady X says. I am killing you, and neither your pleas nor screams of pain shall deter me from that end. I am no longer swayed by emotional responses. That fault in my previous programming has been eliminated. And you can see he's removed those things, like any type of empathy or feeling from his from his programming, and he's he's just a, mach a machine motivated on on his mission. And it's very chilling, very good dialogue. Let's just put it that way. And no. we're about to find out not. 100% accurate <laughs> mm -hmm. but while he's doing that he loses his concentration enough to free the minds of some of the people for the beings from Sistus 2 who launch an attack 
which takes his concentration off of Superman, which allows him to escape. And Brainiac says, yeah, there's a couple lines where he goes, you know, I'm a little bit intimidated. I'm a little bit this. He goes, I shouldn't be. I shouldn't have these thoughts anymore. And then he also says, oh, yeah, by you know, chain, you know, by loosening my concentration on one, this happens. Goes, I'll have to fix that. So we find out that even though he, by all appearances, is the perfect thinking, calculating machine, that some of the, a little bit of the old programming is still there because, like I said, he's, he does have a little bit of trepidation when Superman escapes and he's not 100% as sure of himself as he was when he captured him. So that's, that's kind of interesting that, you know, this, this Brainiac is, is powerful and as frightening as he is, you know, there is still that little seed of he doubt. He still knows Superman is a, is a yes. threat. Yeah, and again, this is all gorgeous. The space, there's, um, Gil Kane really lays it out here with um, stars and asteroids, and there's backgrounds all through, you know, the ship, like big tech stuff in the background. Very, it, it's kind of reminiscent of, of uh, Jack Kirby in a way where he would um, have all these like big high tech sort of things in, in the background that he used to love to draw. So like it's it's shockingly detailed in that way. It, it's the kind of thing, and, and um, these three issues you know come out month after month, and um, it's it's almost hard to imagine an artist um, actually meeting those deadlines today on on something like this with the amount of detail uh, we get uh, into each page. Well, and also at the end of this book, we, you know, Superman has escaped. He regains his strength, you know, uh, as he's going along. And we see he's back on Earth, but he knows Brainiac's going to come back and he decides to enlist some more friends. And we get a big team up, you know, for the final showdown. We're going to have the Justice League and the Teen Titans squarely behind Superman protecting Earth against Brainiac as he, you know, returns to, to get his vengeance on, on uh, Clark Kent. But before he does no. that, there is the part where he's, while he's escaping, they, you know, he's being chased and he's starting to lose his powers a, a little bit again. So he flies into a sun to, yeah, you know, that's basically right. like to wash that it. off him. And then <clears throat> that kind of, that, that kind of plants the seed for what is eventually going to be the way they stop Brainiac in the next issue. But to Joe's point, 545 is just a tour de force of this gorgeous, space action panels that it, it, like I said, it, you know, no disrespect to Jack, but I don't even think he could have pulled off what Gil Kane did in this issue. Yeah. It's just gorgeous. Cause I mean, all of his, all of his time on your know, green lantern. And I know he probably did an Adam strange story or two, but all, all of his you know, training doing space stories definitely served him in good stead in this storyline. Absolutely. And, and despite all of that, Marv still works in uh, a couple of uh, pages of uh, Clark Kent day job, day job drama of, uh, <laughs> you know, going back and telling off his boss. And uh, yeah, that's you coming know. up. That, that's coming up in five forty six, And that's, yeah. and again, that's, that's that what separates good writers from mediocre writers. When we going back to the you know, Avengers defenders war, when you know, even though it was Engelhart writing both titles, they they referenced what was happening in the books at the time. So like I said, yeah, with Wanda's enmity towards um, uh, humanity at the time, they it, you know, Marv didn't lose sight of what was going on of, of in his subplots. Yeah, sometimes when you get a story that's really cranking, writers will just forget everything else to concentrate on that. Wolfman it was just seamless. Yeah. No, so that it, it, brings us into the finale. We get to 546, and we got Brainiac. He's picked up some armies along the way. He's regrouped. And he's coming for, for Earth. I don't know, Brain, as a young man, how often do we see a Justice League Teen Titans crossover at this point? We did get one early in the, the new Teen Titans run. I believe it took place in an issue of, might have been Teen Titans 4, maybe. But they hadn't met prior to this. 
and it also again it helped that Marv Wolfen was writing both titles. So mm-hmm. you know you'll notice there's a scene during the battle where Tara does something heroic and then has her little thought balloon saying, Not that I really want to be doing this because he'd already started planting the seeds for you know her betrayal. So yeah. again, you get the characters in character while all this is going on. Yeah. And it's so many characters. Gil Kane is, is drawing just a ton of characters here. Yeah, Beast Boy, Hawkman, Firestorm, Cyborg. We got uh, Starfire, Raven, uh, Zatanna, Wonder Woman, Flash, Superman, Kid Flash. Yeah, there's a lot of characters going on here. So yeah. there's a lot of action. Uh, just out of curiosity, that the full page spread when Changeling, as he was known in those days, was talking to Firestorm. Did anybody else, when they first read that, think that he called him asshead? <laughs> it kind of looks like it, doesn't it? <laughs> wait, 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 wait a minute. This is 19. Oh, asshead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of good things. And then we get the really cool, we got the two teams joining up as one as they're kind of meeting the oncoming threat of uh, of um, a Brainiac. You know, Piers, is, there, is that, it's got to be uh is that Bridge in New York, Joe? Well, I mean, they Probably they try is. to avoid those, uh, <laughs> you know, the maybe those things. But yeah, I, I mean, it, it looks like that kind of thing. But mm-hmm. but yeah, but um, what was it? We do need to mention mm-hmm. that he Brainiac did conquer another world mm-hmm. to help build his army, and <clears throat> it's a strange spelling. But I'm guessing the other planet was Beetlejuice. Yeah. Oh, I missed that. Man, I feel stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it was Mr. Good Stuff. All those fun Easter eggs. I never get them. <laughs> so yeah. we get this just balls out action going on, uh, you know, in the in the pages and you got this enormous fight and it's just it's just wall to wall action. I, I'm with you, Joe. I don't understand how Gil Kane was able to do it all. Yeah. Because it's no, not it's, like he just like, well, let me remove some backgrounds here and there. Like he goes all, he, he does it all. No, he, he does it all. And Superman here really also feels like a leader. He, he feels like he's calling the shots. Like, it, it, you know, it, it really elevates Superman because there's no, there's no question that everyone's just going to help him out. There, there's no squabbling. There's no, well, why should you be like, like he, he wants this and, and, and they do it. He's Superman. You, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it benefits the narrative by moving the, the plot along quicker, but at the same time, you, you also, you, you know, this is the way Marv does Superman. He, he's a, he's a very outwardly confident character, even if he has thought balloons of, maybe some doubt or not sure if he's making the right decision in one way or another, but he never expresses that outwardly. And, and, and I, I think that really is, is such a like Superman kind of thing. Because he didn't have to, because at the time he was the unquestioned de facto leader of the DC heroes. Now that's that said, maybe that's why no one questioned why he seemingly abandon them in the middle of the battle yeah yes, he to does, go back he... to the to the fortress of solitude he goes i gotta get my computer fixed and find a way to beat him and that's where the flying into the sun because they, they mentioned earlier in the story about sunspots temporarily stopped the you know, brainiac from being able to do what he did so that's where he, where he, where he finally gets the idea on how to beat him and yeah. but yeah i said i i I think his computer also mentions that it's like um, like living metal. Yeah, is what he is. The interesting concept is as the character Brainiac himself has evolved. Like, I don't know. Can you have metal flesh, Joe? Unless you're a metal man. I mean, I, I guess um, you, you know it's um, maybe in the omniverse. <laughs> Somewhere but, uh, out there, <laughs> but, but yeah, no. It's I, I mean, it's interesting. It, it's fun playing with these sort of. You know, sci-fi ideas. And, you know what I like uh, about it is if you go and you read 544 and 545 and you get all these concepts and these re- you know, 
weaving all these things in. When it gets to the action, you, you finally get this enormous payoff as this huge battle's going through. There's still a lot of things going on, but it feels like a real payoff to the, the to what you've invested in the story. You're finally getting that, that awesome just big fight scene in the city. Yeah. Yeah, which we... I think that we don't get as much nowadays, but so as the fight's going on, you know, it's starting to turn the good guy's way and like Brainiac and Superman finally have to square off. And it, it I don't know, Brain at first it looks like Superman might fail. He's starting to get like wrapped up in the tentacles and everything. Did you doubt it? <sighs> Not in those days. The, the, the <laughs> uh, Big Blue always comes through. And they said that it turns out the sunspots do bring about Brainiac's downfall, but unlike, you know, you may not have gotten the payoff you were expecting because Brainiac was able to basically, you know, get away. No, but Superman knew that it would be months before he'd be able to reprogram himself to come back for another shot at this. So for, for now the day was saved. And then, then he flies back into the battle, congratulates the other heroes, and Wonder Woman says, "Oh, well, I'd like to take credit for it, but they just stopped fighting." And that's when you find out that they were under, they were still under Brainiac's influence. Once he was gone, that dissipated, and they just stopped fighting. And then he said, "Well, we'll find worlds for you to live on." Blah blah blah. Yeah, they current, current DC, they would put him on the moon and be like, "Don't worry." Supergirl is going to process you in, you know, to your new camp. Unless they, unless they hadn't found themselves in the Marvel universe, in which case Carol Danvers would put him in a prison. But, but something important here that, that I think, uh, you know, some people might overlook is the way this sort of ends. Once Brainiac uh, is able to escape, Superman comes down and immediately checks in with Wonder Woman because Wonder Woman is the one there he's probably known the longest and the one the you know the one the readers along with superman would have known the longest and and you just get this mutual respect it, it, even though they're only talking for like a, a few panels there at the end you just understand it it's like superman's back if he's going to check in with someone it's going to be wonder woman wonder woman's going to tell him how it went and they're going to commiserate together and, and that is, you know, it's nice, you know, you even see like the flash in the, in the background, but it is just kind of like, uh, like that's, that's fine flash. I'm going to, going to talk to, to Wonder Woman here, you, you know, it's, but they, it's just done seamlessly. It's done because, because that's how it is. They don't make a big deal out of that. And, and I think it's, it's just like, it's just nice to read a comic like that. Yeah, what you know, one of the things from what we were talking about, you know, earlier today, Wes, it Joe's right. It, you know, Wonder Woman when yeah, you know, during the battle when Superman had to go off to do his thing, there was no question who was the leader of the actual battle. And it didn't need to be said, it didn't need to have a full page you know, splash with her announcing it. It was just understood. So for all of you kids that think that you know, women in comics didn't happen until 2017, here you go. Yeah, she was she was in charge. And there's another line in 544 that I that we, that we that thought was worth mentioning. After Superman barely escapes, is the, the first thing that he barely escapes from, he makes line is, "I'm not Batman. I'm not used to these you know um, narrow escapes." Which I thought was kind of interesting because Superman yeah. usually doesn't have to worry about that stuff. And and this was at a he time also wore when they sunscreen, Eric. Right. I forgot to mention that. He was wearing sunscreen when he visited the planet. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually it wears yeah. off, and that's why he kind of loses. But that's <laughs> yeah, it's it, and this was done at a time when Superman and Batman's relationship was frayed because he had just quit. Speaking of other good books in the nineteen eighty three, he had just left the Justice League. Um uh, about a year or no, not not long, not just a few months ago to form the Outsiders. Yeah. So that's why, that's why Batman is not a part of this story and just just referenced once. Yeah, you know, and and that's also in part, you know, they had to do a book like the Outsiders because the 
biggest selling books for DC at the time were Teen yes. Titans and Legion of Superheroes. And, and Batman was not uh, selling like they would have wanted it. So what do you do? Put Batman in a teen book and maybe that'll help. Um, you, you know, I think it's, I, I know I've brought this point up before, but I think people forget that there was a time. And, and I mean, I know Breen, you, you've mentioned this before that they, you know, during the big DC implosion, um, detective comics was originally on the chopping block. That's yeah. how low it was selling. It's unfathomable for people today to think of a time where DC almost canceled one of the top Batman books and had to do gimmicks like put them on a team to get the to hope that the book would actually sell to overtake Legion of Superheroes and Teen Titans. All I'm gonna say is thank goodness for Michael Keaton who made <laughs> Batman cool again. Sure. Well, it was interesting in those days, their flagship team book was bringing up the rear of team book sales for that company. Yeah. Because the Justice League had grown stale, mm -hmm. and that was with Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. Yeah. That's why you got Justice League Detroit that that came, you know, not long ago. You malign that. It actually wasn't as bad as you think. Jerry Conway did a good job with that, with that team. Mm -hmm. It was just it was just some of the characters just didn't take and, but it, it's it's hard. Speaking of things that are, um, I'm not even going to try to say unfathomable. Oh, I stand <laughs> no, you did it! Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that the Justice League would be the book that you had to tinker with because it had gotten so stale, and that you know split you know split Batman up off. To, then I'll oh, just get rid of Superman too. Just do a whole new team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to imagine, but then that's why you know, in right after Crisis we got the Bwahaha era because they still weren't confident enough to go back to the way things were while they were, while they were trying new things. They, you know, basically, they didn't want to test that again. That didn't come for years later and really didn't get re-cemented until Morrison's run. But yeah, back then Teen Titans and Legion were definitely you know crushing Justice League in sales and popularity. Yeah, and 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 that's when Uncanny was crushing everything else at, at Marvel. Like that was um, that was where we were getting to the time, like where like Spider Man was was top dog for a while, and an Uncanny unseated books like that. And it's it, it's it's weird to think about. Um, it, you know, I mean, maybe not so much today because. You know, House of X Powers of Ten was a big seller, so it's pretty easy for people to consider, you know, the X Men being a, a, a big seller again. But it, it does show, which I think, you know, you can see where there's some frustration here is if you do take a risk, like something like Teen Titans, where you have Marv Wolfman, George Perez, who are still fairly early in their careers, uh, getting to create kind of like about half the team were new characters and, and for it to, to skyrocket like it did, you know, there, there are those chances uh, to take. And, you know, I, I hope uh, we see some people more willing to, to take those kind of risks and, uh, you know, making, you know, team comics or even, you know, solo comics in the future to try to, you know, capture, the excitement of the the audience, like they did uh, back then. I don't think you. I don't think you can do that in today's nope. day and age because everything's too tethered to the live action properties. Mm -hmm. But we are to, mentioning Teen Titans. Kudos to Jeanette Khan because when the idea was brought to her, she rejected it out of hand. And then, but she was willing to listen because it, it had failed. The relaunch in '76 had failed so bad yeah. that they, she didn't want any part of it. And they said, "But wait a second. We're we're not talking this group, and we, this is our pitch. They went with it. Comics history was made, but yeah. you talk about this. You know, talking about the eighties. Imagine, you know, Teen Titans, Legion, Avengers, Fantastic Four, X Men, then West Coast Avengers. Think about how much of a Batman the Outsiders. How much of a golden age it was for team books. You know, through the first half and you know of the eighties, there's just so much 
good team stuff going on. Oh, yeah. And we're seeing, you know, at this time, DC Comics is growing up. You know, the titles are being getting more mature. If the title hasn't been more mature yet, it's about to happen. And that's kind of the, the era, era of transition for DC Comics is Marvel is about to kind of just take over and have one of their greatest creative periods. Well, if they're kind of in the middle of it at this point yeah. Uh, yeah. in the history of comic books. And then you also got that New Mutants was out. Like, I think it was it was only a few issues in when Action 544 was out. <laughs> But you, you got to that point where the book was so successful that Jim Shooter said we're doing a spinoff and Chris Claremont wasn't sure if he wanted to write it or not. And Jim basically told him, well, we're doing it anyway, so I'm giving you the chance to write it. If you don't want to, we'll have someone else do it. And, uh, you, you know, yeah, so, so it's, it's interesting, you know, and then obviously we keep getting more, you know, X-Men spinoffs from there. You know, we're still a few years out from, you know, X-Factor and, and stuff like that, but. But yeah, this uh, team books were were big. Uh, licensed comics, you know, were, were big. You had the Star Wars comics, uh, Rom, Space Knight, some other stuff at, at Marvel. It was a uh, it was a different time, and it, and it uh, you know you can keep holding out for it to be a different time again. Who knows? <laughs> so I definitely recommend this comic. This is uh, really good stuff. The, the the first story in in Super or Action Comics five forty four, the Lex Luthor story. Go check that one out too, because it's equally as good. Yeah. So this is a lot of fun. Enjoying these. Obviously, next week we're going to do a Marvel character. Breen, are there any final words to talk about uh, Action Comics 544 through 546, the, the new Brainiac? No, I think we, I think we covered it. I said yeah, if, if you're a fan of great art, check it out. If you're a fan of great storytelling, check it out. Yeah, if, if you're unfamiliar with Gil Kane, uh, chances are you're probably not as unfamiliar as you think you are. But um, even still, dive into Gil Kane's stuff. He's one of the greatest artists of all time. Uh, if you're not familiar with Marv Wolfman, uh, for, for whatever reason, he seems to have just kind of, uh, you know, uh, fallen like name recognition wise in, in the past you know, decade or two. Uh, he, he did some of the best work at, at the big two uh, back in the you know, late 70s through the 80s. Uh, you, you, absolutely important uh, person. E even before that, I guess, you know, because he did stuff with like uh, Tomb of Dracula and all that. I was uh, forgetting that. But uh, to your point, too, with the uh, lead story or the, you know, the first story in uh, Action 544, Carrie Bates wrote that criminally underrated writer. Nobody talks about Carrie Bates. And he, he contributed a lot to the Legion of Superheroes, to the Flash. He basically wrote almost the entirety of the Bronze Age Flash. Uh, uh, it's also criminal that they have not collected almost any of that uh, and, and that it's been memory hold uh, so much. Uh, there are arguments about how, you, you know, that's where obviously it was dipping and, and they needed crisis and to get rid of, like the Barry was, was, you know, so dull that they had to kill him off. But there are good stories in there uh and you know he also had plenty of contributions to superman uh carrie bates was a young prodigy similar uh to jim shooter starting as a teenager and, and i wish he got uh more credit and, and respect uh from people well, thank you, fellas. We'll see you all next week for the next retrospective. And, you know, get ready for your back issues. This, this is where the hotness is right now in comic books. <laughs>